Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise, and along with Pastor Kirk, we are the pastors here at Braddock Street, and we're so glad that all of you are here with us in worship today. There's a few things we would love for you to know as we get started. First of all, if you have a prayer request this morning, you will find a blue card like this in the pew rack in front of you, and you can fill these out, and during our first hymn, our ushers will come by and pick these up so that we can pray over all of these requests later on in our service. And anyone who is new to us today, please find a green card like this in the pew rack in front of you. And if you would fill that out and leave it for us in the offering plate when it comes around, that would be a great way for us to get to know you a little bit better. I also want to say good morning to everybody who's with us online. We are so glad that you all are here. Remember, you can let us know that you're worshiping with us. Say hello. Say good morning. Um, if you have a prayer request, you can share it right there in the Facebook comments. And if there's anybody who's new to us who's online today, you'll find a digital sign-in card there in the Facebook comments that can help us get to know you a little bit better as well. And now I'd like to invite you all to stand as you are able and join with us in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Please join in our opening prayer. O oh God, in Jesus Christ we celebrate your power at work. You raised him from the dead to rule with you forevermore. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may see the hope to which Christ calls us, a realm of eternal peace. Amen. I'd like to invite you to remain standing as you were able and join with us in our opening hymn, number 732, Come We That Love the Lord. Good morning, I'm Ann Brewster. I'll be reading from Ephesians. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus 
and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all the word of God for the people of God.
Indeed, thanks to our choir lifting our hearts. Today, um, my name is Kirk Nave, one of the pastors here at Braddock Street Church, and we survey our congregation from time to time. What, um, what concerns you? What perhaps would you like to hear about? One of those things we heard recently was you'd like to hear a word of hope. And we've got just a few Sundays now between All Saints last week and, you know, turn around the corner, it's the first Sunday of Advent. So in between time, we're going to have a worship series entitled Hope Remains. Let us pray together. Indeed, God, you are the rock upon which our lives, our joy depends. Help us to hear again, Lord, the reason for our hope and the call to participate in what you are doing to change the world. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. What is our human fascination with bad news? Have you ever thought of that? The Germans even have a word for excessive uh, ideas about wanting to hear bad news. It's called schadenfreude, and that is the delight that we find in other people's sufferings, as though our own were not enough, right? And then there's what media does to portray it in an overdramatic way. In the words of Don Henley and Danny Korchmer in a song called Dirty Laundry way back in the 1980s, we hear these words, we got the bubble-headed bleach blonde who comes on at five. She can tell you about the plane crash with a gleam in her eye. It's interesting when people die. We need dirty laundry. Can we film the operation? Is the head dead yet? You know, the boys in the newsroom got a running bet. Get the widow on the set. We need dirty laundry. What is our fascination with bad news? And again, the way media over-dramatizes because they need our attention through the next commercial break. So we get headlines like cockroaches found in a local school cafeteria, what you need to know to protect your children. Now friends, I've lived in apartments with cockroaches. Um, they're not nice. I'm sure they carry viruses, but I dealt with it. It's not the end of the world. There's enough problems for us to worry about. At times it seems so overwhelming, I have to remind myself that, that in and of itself, news media is an entertainment industry depending upon advertising revenue. That's why they present the news in the way that they do, okay? That's their job. I also have to remind myself that bad news is the extraordinary, the out of the norm. When I have a good day, that's not newsworthy, nor should it be. But when good news becomes the extraordinary, that's when we're in real trouble. And just to protect my own mental health, you know, when I go on vacation, I just turn it off. Just turn off all the news to give my spirit a break. It'll be there when I take it up again, right? What are the world's worst problems in your mind? The things that make you lose sleep at night. Is it hunger? Poverty? Homelessness? Is it how our community and our world, our own nation, are struggling with drug abuse? This is a graph just showing to us the increase in deaths by overdose in the last 20 years. The data comes from the Center for Disease Control. The number of deaths have grown 500% in the last 20 years. Last, excuse me, in 2021, the CDC reported 107,000 deaths in one year from drug overdose. Recently, I was honored to serve my community through a thing called grand jury duty. Um, grand jury is not like regular jury duty where you just deal with one case. We review a number of cases and we were asked to say, yes, there's enough evidence to go ahead for a trial. Or, or not. It's not determining innocence or guilt. But what struck me was dealing with a number of cases at one time, how almost every case had something to do with drugs, possession, distribution, or someone breaking in or committing some kind of crime in order to support their drug habit. It's overwhelming when you think of what a problem this is. Maybe there are other things that make you lose sleep. There's enough. Active shooters, in houses of worship, 
in schools and other public places. Violent street crimes that don't get reported that much because they happen every single day. Climate change, can we stop it? Can we reverse the harm that we've already done? Immigration, thousands and thousands of people trying to come into our nation as they leave their homes, their families, fleeing from crime, corruption, and poverty, but in numbers that are just overwhelming for us to deal with. Maybe it's the political and social divisiveness. You know, can our gover government even govern given all of our divisions and do anything about our nation's problems? And then there is war, the war in Ukraine, which continues to drag on and on and on, and now war in the Middle East. It's so complex, isn't it? Oh, I know we need to, to uh, condemn the attack by Hamas on October 7. We almost call in, also must call into question the tactics used by Israel as they seek to defend themselves against Hamas. We also need to condemn Hamas for using innocent civilians as kind of a human shield so that they can put tunnels under things like refugee camps and hospitals. But we also need to call into question the treatment of Palestinians and the continual overtaking of Palestinian territories. It's complex, isn't it? And we have to acknowledge it's been going on since 1948 with root causes that go back over a thousand years. It's overwhelming. What can you and I do? Well, we can pray for peace. We can call for peace. And here in our own country, we probably need to actively engage in the fight against xenophobia. That's the fear of the other, you know, as there are Jews and Muslims in, in, in a conflict. Sometimes people oversimplify and then make assumptions, uh, prejudice by remote association about Jews and Muslims in our own country and they can experience harm. We must remind all of ourselves and the world around us that we are called by our Creator to love our neighbor no matter who they are. It can leave us, though, feeling powerless, can it? And we can be paralyzed with despair. Where is there hope? Perhaps one of the more hopeful books in all of the Bible is the book of Ephesians. Among its themes, it taps into the idea that the mystery of God's will is revealed through Jesus Christ and through Christ's church. God's will is that all of the universe be brought together in Christ and that the church be brought together in unity so that it might fulfill God's plan for all of creation, not just for itself. And it goes on to make the point that the church is the very instrument of God's grace in the world. I hope you hear that this morning. You are a part of the solution. Backing up, where is their hope? First, we have hope from Ephesians because we, we understand and we acknowledge where the power comes from. Let's look at verses 20 and 21 of, from what we heard this morning. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. This is nothing less than God's power. And Ephesians makes the point, the power to raise Jesus from the dead and to sit him on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. When you tap into where the power comes from, you have every confidence to make it through your day. Now, when I think about God's power, I, myself, I typically think about God's creation. The vastness of space ever expanding, and my mind can't wrap my head around it. And then back to the minutia of what makes creation and you and me, the atoms, the subatomic particles, right? Arranged divinely in some way that you and I have thought and speech and the gifts of music and all of that. What a miracle is God's creation. Save God that set all this in motion is still engaged in this creation, making this world a better place. But when Ephesians is talking about it, it's talking about this God who has the power over death itself. When you tap into that kind of power, how can you despair? You tap into the power, you have confidence. Uh, my first car was a 1980 Pontiac Sunbird with an AM radio and four 
manual transmission, four gears, manual transmission, ran it into the ground, right? I was a young, single person, didn't have a whole lot of income. I just kept driving it. I needed it to get to work so that when the starter started to go bad, and I knew enough to know it was the starter, boys and girls, when you push the button now, it used to be turn the key, you know, you hear this high whine, and nothing happens with the spark plugs. You can tell it's not firing, right? That, that means the starter's starting to go bad. So sometimes the, turn the key, and it would start. Sometimes, you know, I'd try it again. I learned to park the car on a hill. See, different crowds. When I ask younger people that, they're like, what? <laughs> so if you don't know what we're talking about, um, if you have a standard transmission car, you can park it on a hill, give the car a nice little shove, right? Put the clutch in, put it in gear, pop the clutch, turn the key, and, and, and you hear it. You hear those spark plugs begin to fire. You feel the power, and inside I'm going, yeah, I'm going to make it to work today. <laughs> Eventually, of course, boys and girls, don't leave it like that. Get the car fixed. That can be dangerous. Um, but the point is simply, when you tap into the power, you have every confidence, right? You know you're going to move. All I had to remember was to park the car on yet another hill. With God it moving within us, when we're tapped into where the power comes from, we have every confidence to make it through this day and every day. Secondly, Ephesians makes the point that the church is the instrument of God's grace. In other words, you get to participate in what God is doing to make this world a better place. Let's read in verses 17 and 18. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Right? You know where the power is coming from. As you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. The human condition is such that we can despair and feel paralyzed and powerless. The Christian faith says, no, we know where the power comes from. We know that this God is not done with this world or with any of us individually. And God has called us to share the love of Jesus Christ in ways that make this world a better place. I had another one of those conversations a week or two ago, and I know you've had them too with loved ones and friends. It was a young man, seemed like a wonderful human being, and he said, found out that I was a pastor, and he's like, yeah, I believe, I just don't believe you need to be a part of a church. And it wasn't the context where I could go deeper in the conversation, so I, I left it there. I wanted to leave on friendly terms for another day. But I wanted to say so badly, so what are you doing with it? You know, has faith inspired you to be a part of the solution? Because I know my own human nature, and I know without you, first of all, I wouldn't be engaged in worship. I wouldn't be engaged in studying the Bible in small groups. I wouldn't hear the Word of God that says, your neighbor's hurting today in the many ways that we talked about, and there are many, many, war, many, many more. I wouldn't hear that. I wouldn't be in awareness of the problems around. If I came to awareness, then I would say, well, people are hungry. They've always been hungry. What can I do about it? And we just remain paralyzed. Friends, if there is one thing that I think is unique about our United Methodist faith is that we emphasize this. That salvation, professing faith in Jesus Christ, that's just the beginning, okay, of the journey. There's a lifelong, lifelong journey of following Jesus Christ, learning more and more about who Christ is and how we might become more and more like him by the power of the Holy Spirit and serve in Christ's name. And that's where we will find fulfillment and joy in the midst of a world filled with problems. We have been put on this planet redeemed from our self-centered sinfulness for a reason, not just for our own sake, but that God might use us, indeed nothing less than the power of God within us, to do amazing things. There are global challenges. There is war. And we are called to pray for peace and to work for peace at all times. As I, as I said to you before, first of all, thank you all veterans. Have a wonderful veterans weekend. But you also need to know your pastor is going to be the last person that says our nation ever needs to go to war. 
right? We're about peace, and those are complex issues. Thanks for your service in making our world a free place. But at the same time, we pray for peace at all times, and we work for peace. And in the current context, we want to say everyone is loved in spite of the conflict around us. Is there hunger? Will there always be hunger? Yes. And oh, by the way, next week, here's the advertisement. Next week, we're going to have service worship, which means you come to worship, we invite you to dress a little less formally so that you can go to work, do mission right after worship over in the fellowship hall. We are having Rise Against Hunger bring all the packaging where we will package tens of thousands of meals together. Yes, I said tens of thousands, right? There is hunger. There will be hunger. But you, the church, are an instrument of God's grace, and you are going to feed hungry people. It's powerful stuff. There's so many global ch- challenges. We are, we are called in the, in the fit face of climate change and being stewards of God's creation to limit our use of fossil-fueled energy and, and to plant trees, friends, the lungs of God's earth. There is homelessness, and our church will host the homeless in our facility the first week of January and participate with other congregations in our community to provide shelter. But all year long, our church supports other shelter ministries in Winchester and Frederick County. Those are the global challenges. Some of us this this morning are facing personal challenges. And I don't know what that is for you. They are myriad. There are illnesses. There are mental health issues for some of us in this room, for our family members. There are addictions, maybe for somebody in this room, or a family member. There is divorce. There are financial struggles. There is grief. There on and on go the list of our personal struggles. Same principles apply, friends. God is God, the Almighty, the creator of the universe, the one who is not finished with you or any of creation, the one who has power over death itself and calls each of us as a community to be supportive even in the personal struggles to bring God's grace and God's love for one another so that we can come through anything anything where is their hope hope is found in God who has power over death and who calls each of us to share Christ's love that your world and mine may might be better than it is let us pray Holy God, thank you for hope. Thank you for the promise of deliverance that we see evidenced in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us hear again by the power of your Holy Spirit the call to be involved, to not shrink from despair, but to pin our hopes on you and to continue to share Christ's love in a world that desperately needs it. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our community of faith, Braddock Street United Methodist Church, that we might continue to lift the light of Christ in tangible ways today and forever. And we pray for our neighbors who each have reasons for despair today. We pray for Dr. Curtis Swing and his family, for Kay Omps, for Harold Ogg and Lucinda Angel, for Bill Stiles, for Chuck Pine, for Bubby Keenan, for John Goodlow, for Pete Bryan, Meredith Titus, Melissa Schatzer, Regina Walker, Ralph and Dee Grimm, Shirley Peterson, Danny Bromley, for Ray Long and his family, Nancy Albert, for Dick Boxwell, for Tim Clark, for Liz Eppinger, for Lynn Yates, for Bill Arnold, and for others whom we name in our hearts. And as our Lord is the Prince of Peace, Lord, we continue to pray for peace in Ukraine and peace in the Middle East. All these prayers we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
It is important to us here at Braddock Street that you all know what kind of wonderful things we are able to do in our community because of your generosity. We want to raise up for you one of those wonderful things that we are able to support, which is the Edinburgh Charter House School. This school allows students who would have trouble in mainstream public education to have the support that they need, to have those tailored programs that they need that will help them thrive in their education. Thank you for being the kind of church that cares enough about kids that you might not ever meet, that you want to make sure that they get the best start off in life that they can in a good and supportive school. Our United Women in Faith are definitely big supporters of it, as are many different Methodist churches in our area. Thank you for being one of them. We will invite our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offer offering.
Let us pray. Holy God, we give with joy into your kingdom today and ask that you would bless these gifts and us to your service. Amen. We'd like to invite you to remain standing as you are able and join with us in affirming our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our final hymn is number 730, O Day of God Draw Nigh. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Thanks to those of you online. We're glad you're here. A um, couple things as we go. First, next Sunday, as I mentioned, we will have Rise Against Hunger. They bring all the equipment. Doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. It's a multi-generational packing event, and it's a wonderful experience. Come next Sunday prepared to do that. Um, also, we apologize for the confusion about registering attendance with those iPads on the stanchions in the gathering space. We think we fixed the problem, which is there's only one list uh, for worshipers. It doesn't matter which service you attend. We ask that you simply scroll up and down, find your name alphabetically, and touch it. Please do not try and use the search bar and type your name in. It makes it go kerf kerflui, but our staff have taken some extra special training this week. Hopefully, we can help you more now. Um, and lastly, I want to in invite Betty Sue Unger, who works with Operation Remember and our giving tree. She's got a word for us. Hello. The giving tree is up and running. We do have, once again, wish lists from children in our area. We're also assisting Operation Remember with nursing home residents and residents in assisted living facilities. 
The thing about the giving tree is it's such a mission of joy and hope each step of the way. And Bittner and I work hard in advance to get the wish list and get everything coordinated and together. We actually have a pretty good time doing it. Each year, members of the congregation come up and tell us stories about how much fun they had shopping or how they found their grandparents' name or a favorite aunt and the joy that it brought them and reminded them of a loving family member. The wrapping party, it's a multi-generational good time. We have children wrapping, we have grandparents wrapping, everyone's laughing, everyone's having a good time. When we deliver the gifts, whether we're allowed to go to the parties or not, it's a good time and it brings a lot of joy to us because we get to interact with the nursing home residents and they are very thankful for that. And finally, it gets down to where they unwrap their gifts. They know that they matter. They know that they are remembered and that brings joy to them. So this mission brings joy at every step. And I wanna thank you guys for being a part of it and helping us make this possible by taking the tags. Thank you. Thank you, Betty Sue. She will be back in the uh, back part of the gathering space on your right as you leave if you'd like to take a tag and uh, make Christmas special for somebody this year. Where is their hope? God promises the hope and invites you to be an instrument of God's hope in the world through things like the giving tree. Go with that assurance as well as the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.